Emerson, we uh, we have a, a typical uh, time of the year when uh, we put a lot of fall nitrogen on. A lot of beans have come off. As uh, soon as uh, folks get uh, done with harvest, why they're going to think about uh, pulling some anhydrous tanks out. But this year uh, is a little different. We've got some we've got some dry soils over most of Illinois. Is that going to be a con is that a concern to you? Is that going to be a problem? for maintaining that, uh, that ammonia in the soil? Well, ammonia has to dissolve in water when it's released in the soil, but it doesn't take very much water to dissolve it. Ammonia has a real affinity for water. Um, when we say you get a, ammonia can burn your skin, you know, that's really a dehyde, that's from taking the water out. So, but, uh, so it, that's not the big concern. The first concern is is the soil temperature low enough? And we need it low because there's microbes in the soil that convert ammonium from ammonia into nitrate. Uh, and as long as they have the temperatures to do that, they're gonna start that process pretty soon after you apply ammonia. So our big issue is getting the temperature low enough and it takes patience. And that's, <laughs> that's the real issue when the soils are dry enough. People say, well, you know, it'd be really good to be getting that ammonia on now. Um, but the first question is, is the, is the soil temperature low enough and not the moisture? The moisture is less of a concern. Normally it's November before we think the soil temperature, which we want to be 50 degrees or less, and lower the lower the better, but it's usually November. Um, first or second week in November before they get that low and stay that low. That's the important thing. There is some nitrification in this process. Some of that's going on as, uh, anytime the soil temperature is above freezing. It's very slow in the 30s and, and in the mid 40s, but uh, at 45 degrees it, and, and, and months for this to take place, much of our nitrogen we'd put on this fall would be nitrate in the spring before the crop has a chance to take it up. So we we do the best we can with it. Um, putting fall ammonia on is something that's always been part of the ammonia picture, uh, nitrogen picture in, uh, in Illinois since we started using it. And, uh, and we, we don't, generally our data show that you can get good yields but we also show that uh, compared to spring application of ammonia, uh, normally we're going to lose some of the fall application and we're going to lose, you know, it's not a huge amount, but 15 pounds, maybe 20 pounds sometime. And then if it's warm and wet during the winter for periods during the winter, it's probably greater than that. So uh, just in a general sense, you know, I always tell people, if you have any concerns <laughs> about putting it on this uh, this fall, uh, keep next spring as a good option because, you know, some people have started to side dress anhydrous ammonia. It's a great form of nitrogen because it stays where it's put longer than any other form and it won't move until it's been converted to nitrate. And so side dressing uh, ammonia is a, is a wonderful practice. It just takes time and power and uh, and you were driving over the soil again in the spring to do that and that's one reason people like to do it in the fall. Okay let's uh, I appreciate that let me go back and pick up uh, uh, one or two things about the the dryness of the soil. Is there some point where the soil is too dry that you just don't want to put any on? Um, if we can get if if the soil is in shape to get the knife to depth, six to eight inches deep, and release uh, ammonia there, it's almost never too dry. The one issue though is some people have started to do tillage of soybean stubble to try to, I think, make it possible to get those knives into depth. Uh, and that that's bringing up chunks right now. And so, that's certainly not helping. We have to be releasing the ammonia into soil 
that can receive it. We can't be releasing it into spaces between clods out there in the soil because it will just streak for the surface if we do that. And we also have to cover the knife track with some loose soil. So I see a, a lot of tillage of soybean stubble out there right now, and I'm not quite sure why people are doing that. Um, historically, we always thought, well, okay, a knife application um, every 30 inches in the fall, uh, that doesn't disturb the soil a lot. We're always concerned about keeping cover on the soil and uh, soybean residue doesn't have as much cover power as corn residue anyway. And we all know about the spring windy conditions and the blowing soil of the last several springs when it's been dry. And certainly a, a field that's been tilled up now, soybean stubble, it's, it's almost ready to plant. and. Uh, and that's really not a great way to go into the winter and, uh, and hope next spring that the wind won't blow too much when, before we can get it planted and the rain uh, fall comes and keeps the soil dry, uh, moistened so that it doesn't blow. But um, I, I expect this year that by the time we get soil temperatures uh, low enough, and they're in the 50s now, they're not down to 50 degrees yet, um, well, we're, we're supposed to get some rainfall. Um, but I've seen fields around here that are tilled that obviously would have been fit to put anhydrous into. The dryness, as I say, is less of an issue than getting the temperature down. And we think once the temperature gets down, uh, we're probably going to have more soil moisture and, and be able to go with it. It's less of a concern for us, but uh, we know that if the soil is very dry, and if it dries out further after we apply nitrogen, uh, some of that ammonia will actually sort of undissolve and, uh, and can move back to the surface, and we can lose it out to the air. And that's a, that's a big issue. We also use uh, nitrification inhibitors for fall application, and that's just a biological way to keep those microbes <clears throat> from changing the ammonium to nitrate quite as quickly. And that, that helps some. Um, by the time uh, late May is, comes around, next year comes around, and the plants are ready to start taking up this nitrogen, uh, most of it's going to be nitrate. And that, that's when we hope that we don't get big rainfalls that move it down and out of the, uh, through the tile systems. The microbes themselves, they don't need as much moisture to survive and live they're they're pretty uh, pretty pretty hardy guys oh well they're hardy guys but a, a blast of ammonia takes most of them out in the vicinity and then they sort of have to grow back in but uh, normally yes there's plenty of them there the nitrification inhibitors uh, slow them down some in addition to that but uh, yeah we've We've never had ammonium just sitting there because it does because there's no microbes around to do the job. They're they're everywhere, and uh, if they're not there today, they will be tomorrow. Have you seen in the last several years, uh, and you'd kind of mentioned it before, of, uh, of certainly a spring being a good time for side dressing. Have you seen uh, uh, trends away from fall application and increased amount of uh, of uh, uh, ammonia or any sort of nitrogen going on in the spring? Is that something that farmers are changing their practice? There's been some of that based simply on what nitrogen is available. So we have a lot of people now that are not using any anhydrous ammonia. Right. Um, probably 50 years ago that wasn't as common as it is today. In some cases the people that are selling nitrogen fertilizer, they've just moved away from ammonia. Ammonia's got uh, two problems. It takes a lot of power and equipment to get it in, into the soil. It has to be put into the soil. And so you have to wait till soil conditions are right. The other one is that it's a dangerous uh, material. It has to be kept in, in sealed tanks that stay sealed. Um, and uh, we've all heard about incidents. Fortunately, those have, there have not been very many incidents of this, of uh, accidents with ammonia. Uh, those that I have been, you know, 
they were more frequent at one time than they are now. People are being very careful. A lot of retailers, uh, people that sell perlite and ammonia, are ones that are also custom applying it. And so there's a, a pretty good industry of that right now. And, um, and so many, many producers that are putting anhydrous on um, may be hiring it to be done. So it's, the fall is just a good time to do it because the soils are usually drier and it's much better condition. And nobody wants to look forward to next spring and say, well, if it starts raining, you know, the middle of April and won't stop, when are we going to put it on? And so that's, that's one thing that drives it. The other thing that has historically driven putting fall nitrogen on is that the uh, product has been cheaper in the fall than it is in the spring. And we saw that a year ago, you know, the best uh, prices for nitrogen a year ago were in August, where you could buy nitrogen, you know, and, it, and if you waited till uh, the spring to put it on, you probably paid as much as 50% more for it. So that's, that's not happening this year, at least so far. In other words, the price has, has been staying uh, at a, at a pretty modest level at this point, and it doesn't, at this point in time, it doesn't look like it's heading upward. So that's not, that's never been a consistent incentive to put it on in the fall, except that people always want to lock in a price, and, and uh, the, the difference now is if you lock in that price in August or September, you probably have to take delivery that that's fall. Fun. And so, being sort of forced to go out and put it on sometimes isn't, doesn't re give us a best result in terms of you're going to go out and put nitrogen on in those conditions, you know, or wait till it freezes or something like that. Uh, this is always the uncomfortable part of that. Uh, but um, we get nitrogen on. Uh, the UAN is... is uh, maybe an equal source almost to anhydrous now for fertilizing corn. And it's a big drop off after that. We don't have a lot of other forms um, of fertilizer nitrogen that we're selling. Um, there is urea and so on, but not very, not used very much. The MAP DAP uh, phosphorus sources that we put on, they have some nitrogen in and we always encourage people to count that into your total of nitrogen that you're going to use. Uh, and rate is one of those things we've paid a lot of attention to. And the prices of corn and, and nitrogen going into this next year look like, you know, our rates should be in that modest area. Corn falling soybean in central Illinois, if we're putting on 180 pounds of nitrogen total, that's generally going to be enough for the crop. Um, or let's put it this way, we never know what, that it's not going to be enough. And so we kind of us can assume that it's enough. And uh, if it's not, it's because of what happens next spring, and especially in June as the crop's getting going. And, and if we get some dry weather in June, like we've gotten the last three years now, um, we get A, good yields many times, and B, uh, the nitrogen stays where it is, and, and we don't have a, a problem with it. There's been um, quite a few market advisors and some uh, fertility uh, advisors that have been suggesting uh, when one buys fertilizer, they need to sell corn at the same time to really uh, uh, lock in some profitability. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess it, it depends, but... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not like it was in 2022 with prices, that's for sure. But, um, you know, they, they came up a little bit and, and uh, look like sank back down a little bit too. There's a lot of corn. Our yields are, uh, this year will be one where, I never really expected to say this again, but it looks like we're setting record yields in both corn and soybeans this year in Illinois. and. Uh, and that's normally a cause for great rejoicing, uh, but when the price is higher than it is now, you know, the rejoicing would be considerably louder. Um, 
and that's you know we we just have to be aware of costs and uh, and like to encourage people to you know think about their costs for bushel. It, it certainly looks every every summer has problems, and we think well that may not come out as well as we expected, and it still keeps coming out. <laughs> uh, so with a state average yield above 220, it went, it's 222 I think as it sits right now, um, and I would expect that one will probably be reached. Uh, you know, that's that's pretty remarkable. It's uh, Our previous high was uh, 214, and uh, I don't know when I started my career if I thought that yields, uh, <laughs> trend line yields would double in my time at Illinois, but that's pretty much what they've done. And so um, it's uh, it's breeding and it's it's good management. And it's our soils. I mean, without the soils we have, uh, we probably would not be uh, bragging these up quite as much as we can at this way. But um, it's a good thing in some ways, or, but it makes for bountiful supplies, which always uh, puts pressure on the prices, of course. Well, let's, uh, let's just leave it that way, that while you've been at the University of Illinois, trend line yields have doubled. And so congratulations to <laughs> Emerson Napsinger. And, and farmers across the state are going to say thank you. Well, I only take credit for maybe 10% of that. <laughs> we, uh, and, but, and I don't think they've quite doubled for soybean, but the trend has certainly been the same. <clears throat> and we're, that ratio of corn yields to soybean yields has stayed in that, you know, it's a little more than, than three to one at this point in terms of yield. And uh, that's what I generally use as a rule of thumb is a good soybean yield, a good corn yield in the same year, generally the corn's about three times higher. This year it's more than that, but we have a record high soybean yield that's now projected at 67. And these are just these are just numbers, you know, back, it was very common 20 years, 30 years ago. I'm not getting any better soybean yields than my dad got. And uh, now you don't hear that at all anymore. And if you had told someone 20 years ago that that they'd get some field averages of 85 or 90 bushel, they'd have just thought you were you were blowing smoke, uh, and uh, and that's what people are getting. And it's again, it goes to breeding, and our soils, and our rainfall, and uh, and the management. But um, this relentless breeding for high yield is certainly brought us these high yields to a large extent. And all we need to do with management is sort of keep up with that. It also makes these crops more resilient in terms of, you know, short periods of dry weather, for example. They're not very tolerant of standing water. Uh, in fact, they may be less tolerant than our older crop would have been just because their yield potential is higher and you do more damage in a day of standing water than you used to. But uh, <clears throat> but these are, you know, we talk a lot about climate change and so on, and we won't say that it will never have an effect, um, but so far it certainly has not had a very visible one. And the projections that our yields will, you know, sort of fall off the table by uh, 2040 or 2050, uh, you know they have a they have a lot of deterioration to do if that's going to happen because that line has been at least straight up over the last uh, 30 years and uh, or not straight up as in vertical but it's been a there's been no indications that that uh, progression is slowing down and. Uh, the only reason we don't have higher yields at this point is that we have lots of soils that just don't support higher yields. And that's always going to be the case. Um, <clears throat> and so it's, um, it's working well. Um, and the corn-soybean rotation, I think, is one that's, that's got a lot of strengths. People talk about, oh, that's not sustainable, and you know we have to change what we're doing with crops. Um, as an agronomist, it's really 
it's hard to look to find alternatives.